When I was a kid, I loved to read. I consumed books quickly and over and over and over again. I just couldn't get bored of a story once it was inside my mind. Then high school and university came around and I began to love reading less and less. Most of my reading had become consumed with things that were required for exams and reports and essays. I just simply couldn't find the joy in it anymore. So once I graduated from university, I just didn't read. At most, I would read a book or two a year. Until 2021. At the very start of the year, I managed to read a book that helped me fall back in love with my favorite childhood hobby. And I made a deal with myself. I would read one book a week for a grand total of 52 books. Well, <laughs> I knocked that number out of the park and instead read 63. So without further ado, here is a brief summary for all 63 books I read in 2021, sorted by genre for your viewing pleasure. Let's go ahead and get started with our young reader and middle grade category. Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston. Amari's brother goes missing and the police give up looking for him. A strange man shows up on our doorstep saying her brother has sent her a gift. From there, she's transported to a super secret magical organization and tries to track her brother down despite everyone telling her not to. Whale of the Wild by Roseanne Perry. It's told from the perspective of a whale, deals with issues of pollution and global warming, and it is very, very sad. Warn a kid if you're going to get them to read it. Blue Skies by Anne Bustard. It's set in World War II and a young girl is waiting for her father to return from the army, but he's MIA, missing in action. Her mother's starting to spend a lot of time with a new man and their friendship starts to become very serious. Obviously, the girl doesn't approve and she wants to hold out hope for her father's return. This is also a very, very sad book. Ground Zero by Alan Gratz. It's told from two different perspectives, 10 years apart on 9-11. Mostly, it's about how two different people from opposite sides of the world could hold drastically different knowledge about a war being waged by their country. Well, maybe they can both learn something from each other here. Black Brother, Black Brother by Jewel Parker Rhodes. Two brothers with different skin tones get treated differently at school. They have to find their own ways to deal with this and have to find their own happiness both together and apart from each other. An easy read to talk about the difficult problem of colorism. Go with the Flow by Lily Williams and Karen Schneeman. This is a graphic novel with gorgeous red and white coloring. Four friends fight for easy access to menstrual products at their school. It also talks about how different people have different period experiences. And it's a friendship story. Period. Last Gate of the Emperor by Kwame Mambalia and Prince Joel McConnan. A young boy has to use his video game knowledge to fight off vengeful alien invaders. The uncle's secretive nature and crazy unbelievable stories might be covering up a fantastic family secret. And also augmented reality could be way cooler in real life if we allowed it to be. Moving on to our science fiction category. The Galaxy in the Ground Within by Becky Chambers. Tiny Planet acts as a gas station for traveling ships. Travelers get stranded on the planet's surface when explosions occur in space above them. No one can leave and no one can get contact to their ship. Tyler and patience are the only way that people can learn to survive together, especially when they come from vastly different cultures with different histories and expectations. Pretty much reminds me of Star Trek. I should also note that The Galaxy in the Ground Within is actually the fourth book in Becky Chambers's Wayfarer series. However, I didn't read the first three books and I still loved it. My theory is that the four books all take place in the same universe, but it's not a linear story. An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. April May accidentally makes first contact with an alien race and posts it on YouTube. She's suddenly thrown in the middle of this huge mystery that she doesn't know how to deal with, but the fame might be going to her head. It's about how social media shapes our lives and changes our perspectives of things. Uh, kind of. Dystopian? The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. This is actually the prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy. It's about President Snow before he was President Snow, and how he helped the games become what they are in the Hunger Games trilogy. Spoiler alert, not everyone in the capital liked the games when they were first introduced. Apocalyptic, Trashlands by Allison Stein. Sea levels rising caused great floods that reshaped the world's land masses. Small communities have cropped up around the country where people can help each other survive. Some people are still more powerful than others. Trashlands itself is a community run by a very controlling man who pretty much makes women, let's just say, work for their money. There's nothing really too dangerous or adventurous that happens, but it's a decent slice of life book, which is kind of missing from the apocalyptic genre. Fantasy, Lore by Alexandra Bracken. This is actually my favorite book that I read this year, and it is the book that got me back into reading. It's kind of like if the Percy Jackson series met the Hunger Games series. As punishment, the lower gods are forced by Zeus to fight for their powers every 10 years. If they die, the mortal that kills them gets their powers. Lore, the main character, she wants out of the fight, but there's
there's no really escaping your heritage. This book is about what happens when she accidentally gets pulled back into the fight after she's been hiding for the past 10 years. Each of Us a Desert by Marco Shiro. The main character has a special power that allows her to forgive the sins of her village. She's the only person in her village that has this power, so she's overburdened and never really gets rest. She escapes her village in an attempt to find a way to get rid of her power so that she could live as a normal person. Let's just say that guilt is a hell of a thing. Wings of Ebony by J.L. Young girl finds out that she's magical and a half god. Her absent father reappears in her life to take her to his magical island to teach her how to use magic. There's a lot of strong themes of community and colonization inside of this book. The Faceless Old Woman Who Secretly Lives in Your Home by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. It's based on Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner's podcast, Welcome to Night Vale. This book is actually a pirate adventure that has hints of the supernatural. Badass female pirates are cool. Magical realism. The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Nora sadly decides to take her own life, but instead of dying, she is transported to a magical library. She's allowed to see what her life would be like if she made one decision differently. And then she's allowed to do this over and over until she finds a life that doesn't disappoint her. It's easy to predict the end, even from the very beginning of the book, but I think the fun is in the adventure of getting there. The Inheritance of Orchidia Divina by Zardeta Cordova. Orchidia realizes she's about to die and sends for her family from all over the country to join her in one last gathering. A lot of her children and grandchildren dislike her because of family secrets that she's never disclosed and her controlling nature. Her inheritance isn't something that anyone is ready for, and magic that they're unsure of how to control is thrust into their lives. It's told from the perspective of one granddaughter who goes on a journey to find out her family's history and uncover the secrets of Arcadia Divina. Gods Behaving Badly by Marie Phillips. Greek gods all live together in a modern townhouse as roommates. Their magic is disappearing and they forbid each other from using magic in an attempt to keep it for as long as possible. The gods are pissy and terrible and prone to throwing tantrums. I don't necessarily recommend this book because the book deals with many tough issues in a very overly casual and blasé manner. It feels like it was meant to be a tongue-in-cheek comedy that completely missed the mark. Slenderman by Anonymous. It hit all the important Slenderman points for me. It's told through journal entries, text messages, recording transcripts, Reddit posts, and emails. This technology-based, internet-heavy story makes Slenderman feel real. It has huge Marble Hornets vibes and a found footage feel. And it manages to be suspenseful without being horror and leaves you with a lot of questions but then Slender Man always does. On to mystery and thriller. 14 Ways to Die by Vincent Ralph. A girl uses her newfound YouTube fame to try and find her mother's murderer. Her mother was the first victim of a serial killer who went on to kill 13 other women over the years. Putting herself and all the information out there makes her a target and terrible things start to happen to her. Good Girl, Bad Blood by Holly Jackson. Good Girl, Bad Blood is actually a sequel to a book called A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. In A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, Andy Bell, for a school project, tries to solve a local murder-suicide case. By the time Good Girl, Bad Blood starts, the case is solved and Andy starts to put out a podcast about how she solved the case and all the clues she found. Because of this podcast, she kind of gets pulled into another local mystery that she doesn't really want to be a part of because the first one made things really dangerous for her life. Both books are very unpredictable, which I think makes them a good mystery. So I definitely recommend them. Five Total Strangers by Natalie D. Richards. Mira accepts a ride with the girl she met on a plane when their layover flight gets canceled due to an impending storm. She and four other people venture out onto the highway only to be caught off guard when they get caught in the storm. Partway through the trip, it becomes clear that they're being stalked by a madman. Near-death experiences galore. Pride and Premeditation by Terza Pierce. It's the story of Pride and Prejudice if Pride and Prejudice had been a murder mystery. Elizabeth Bennett plays detective when she tries to prove a man innocent after he's accused of murder. She dreams of being a lawyer, but it's not woman's work, so this is the only way she can truly prove herself. It's not 100% historically accurate, but I think it was a lot of fun and I loved reading it. Girl in the Walls by A.J. Noose. After her parents die in a car accident, a young girl takes up residence within the walls of her old family home, after a new family has already moved in. She tries to hide that she's there, but when she becomes careless, the children of the family start to notice her presence. When a conspiracy theorist arrives at their door to help smoke her out, tensions rise and death may be on the horizon. The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delilah. It could possibly be counted as science fiction because there's some weird pseudoscience at the end of the book, but mostly the book is about office culture and the need to throw people under the bus in order to make yourself look good in front of your boss. Hostage by Claire McIntosh. A flight attendant is forced to aid in the hijacking of her plane when she finds out her family has been taken hostage by a terrorist organization. After the hijacking, she has to find a way to get the passengers on her side after they find out she's helped with the plane's takeover in order to get them to take control of the plane again. The events in this book are meant to have repercussions worldwide, but ultimately the book just has a really crazy ending. And this book could have been good if only... Falling by T.J. Newman. After a pilot's family is taken hostage, he must divert his plane from New York City to the U.S. Capitol to crash the plane and kill everyone on board. If he doesn't crash the plane, his wife and two children will be murdered. It was hard not to compare this book to Hostage, especially since they were released only a week apart. The big difference is that Falling 
selling is only supposed to have repercussions in the United States, whereas Hostage has repercussions worldwide. I think both books were okay. They followed their own logic and they make sense in a way that wouldn't make sense if the two scenarios were reversed with the two different characters. Before I Let Go by Marike Nishkamp. A girl returns to her small hometown from college after the suicide of her childhood best friend. She tries to understand her friend's death to get closure, but the entire town treats her as if she's overreacting. The town treats her like an outsider and like she'll never understand the gift they've been given. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Last Girl Ghosted by Lisa Unger. Ren Greenwood meets a guy on a dating app and things quickly get serious. The day after Ren finally tells him that she loves him, a detective shows up on her doorstep and tells her that the man she's been seeing is wanted for questioning in the disappearance of three other women. These three women he is suspected to also have met on the dating app. Ren has to decide whether to help the detective find the man or go off on her own to solve the mystery herself in order to protect her own identity. Contemporary Fiction The Black Kids by Christina Hammond Reeds Ashley is a teenage black girl from a well-off family and has spent her life surrounded by the same well-off white friends. When her white friends' microaggressions turn into outright racism, Ashley seeks refuge with the black kids at school. Ashley's forced to face her own prejudices head-on and has to learn how to love herself along the way. All of this takes place at the same time as the Rodney King beating. Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas This book is actually the prequel to The Hate You Give, but I didn't read The Hate You Give before I read Concrete Rose and actually still haven't read The Hate You Give. I think Concrete Rose was a good standalone book. Concrete Rose is about a teenager named Maverick who finds out that he has a kid. He has to find a way to get out of the gang life, earn cash, and be a good father. Unfortunately, it's not easy to escape the gang life. Yes, No, Maybe So by Becky Albertalli and Aisha Saeed. Yes, No, Maybe So is about a teenage Jewish boy and a Muslim teenage girl. They both canvass for one of their local campaigns in favor of the Democrat candidate. They bond over social issues and the problems that arrive when they knock on the wrong doors. It has a cute, mild romance. Yolk by Mary H.K. Choi. A Korean-American young woman is forced to move in with her older sister after a fight with her roommate. She attempts to hide her poor mental health from her older sister, just as she has her entire life, but struggles when they return to their hometown and get met with the same old comments she used to receive as a teenager. It has strong themes about being open to help when it's offered to you and sisterly love. With the Fire on High by Elizabeth Acevedo. Amani has dreams of becoming a famous chef, but her dreams seem limited because she had a daughter very young. Her classmates and teachers don't seem to understand that her social life, schoolwork, and aspirations have to be put on hold so that she could be a good mom. There is one teacher who tries to look out for her, but even he doesn't seem to get it sometimes. On the Hook by Francisco X. Stork. This has been called a modern retelling of The Outsiders, but I've also compared it to Holes several times. Hector watches his older brother get murdered in front of him and retaliates, but is arrested for his violence and sent to a juvenile detention facility. Now he has to learn how to keep the peace or exact revenge on Joey, who is in the facility with him. The Startup Wife by Tamima Anam. Asha and her best friend pitch an idea for a new social media app and are granted the money for their new startup. Then Asha's husband quickly becomes the face of the new app and is seen as a wise leader to many of the app's followers. When the power goes to her husband's head and he starts to make decisions that Asha doesn't agree with, things quickly start to sour between them. And now Asha has to deal with the monster she accidentally created. Why We Fly by Kimberly Jones and Gilly Seagal. Two girls convince their cheerleading squad to take a knee during the national anthem during a school football game. They receive a lot of criticism from their principal, parents, and certain members of the student body for their actions. When they're roped into continuing the protest and several other school clubs decide to take part, they quickly realize that they may be in over their head. Especially when their squad isn't allowed on the field before the start of the games anymore. And one of the girls is punished far more severely than the other. Can you guess which one is which? Historical Fiction. The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. It's the story of the Greek hero Achilles as told from the perspective of his lover Patrocles. It's a story about war, romance, heartbreak, and death, and it's a great read for anyone interested in the Greek myths and queer romance. The Downstairs Girl by Stacey Lee. It's about a young Chinese-American woman who's struggling to survive in an America that is rife with discrimination. Her job and housing choices are limited, so when she's fired from one job, she decides to take a chance and starts up an anonymous advice column in a local newspaper. Her popularity grows and it becomes harder and harder for her to keep her identity a secret. It's a great read about rising up out of adversity with a little romance to boot. All the Little Hopes by Leah Weiss. It takes place during World War II and is told from the perspective of two young girls who help out on their family farm when the government asks them to sell their beeswax to the military. There's a lot of tough issues in this book surrounding domestic abuse, war, and sanity and grief, but it's mostly just about two girls who are trying to solve a mystery. The Boy in the Red Dress by Kristen Lambert. It's a murder mystery that takes place in a queer speakeasy during Prohibition. When someone dies just outside the bar and their star performer becomes the main suspect, Millie is determined to prove her friend innocence. Can she do it without accidentally giving away Marion's location? Or will Marion hang for a crime he didn't commit? On to Romance. A Touch of Darkness and A Touch of Ruin by Scarlett St. Clair. These books are a modern and glamorous retelling of the Hades and Persephone story. Persephone is posing as a mortal and is desperate to be out from under her mother's very controlling thumb. Hades immediately takes an interest in her when he realizes she's a god without much magical ability. They fall in love and there's some smut throughout the book. 
Very tragic things happen throughout both books, but this is not your typical Hades kidnaps Persephone story. Let's talk about Love by Claire Kahn. When her girlfriend breaks up with her for her lack of interest in sex, Alice swears off dating for good. Then a really cute boy begins working at the same library that she works at. Will she be able to be open with him about her sexuality, or will he make the same mistakes and cause her the same disappointments as her ex? Blackout by Danielle Clayton, Tiffany Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nicola Yoon. During a blackout in New York City, several different romances get their start. They all have one goal in common, get to a party on the other side of the city amidst all the panic. The romances are diverse and cute, and they all have their own histories to share. Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. When their ship crash lands on a frozen planet, a group of women have to find a way to survive before they all freeze to death. One wanders off in seek of food or shelter or any kind of help for their injured. She finds help, but she also just kind of finds a handsome alien stranger. It's a very smutty book. If You Come Softly by Jacqueline Woodson. Two teenagers from the same private school fall in love. Because one is a white Jewish girl and the other is a black boy, they're hesitant to share their romance with their friends and family for fear of what they might think. Their romance burns fast and bright, but then ends in tragedy. Memoirs. World of Wonders by Amy Nezuka Matazio. It's part memoir and part educational. Amy explains little known facts about nature and uses them to relate back to quiet, beautiful memories from her own life. It's a really beautiful and inspirational read intermixed with gorgeous drawings throughout. Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah tells all about his childhood in South Africa during the time of apartheid. He explains how his mother mother sometimes had to pretend that he wasn't her son because his very existence was against the law. He talks about how he never felt like he fit in anywhere, but also used this to his advantage and learned as many languages as possible so that he could interact with all different types of people. The end of the book is tragic and sad, and I don't think I should say more. Girl Interrupted by Susanna Kaysen. Susanna Kaysen writes about her two-year stint in a mental health ward after her attempted suicide and her diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. This book is actually very quick to get through and reads a lot like a slice-of-life novel. We Should Hang Out Sometime by Josh Sunquist. Josh Sunquist writes about his romantic failures throughout his lifetime. He ends the book with a story about how he met his wife, and it's super cute. Seeing Ghosts by Kat Chow. Kat Chow talks about her struggles with mental health after her mother's death. She explains that there were certain things her mother told her as a kid that she carried with her as an adult that scared her to her very core. She also laments her and her family's inability to properly grieve a death. Easy Crafts for the Insane by Kelly Williams Brown. Kelly Williams Brown talks about her journey with her mental health after a period of time where she was unable to work after breaking both of her arms in two separate accidents. She sought solace in creating simple crafts, but the damage was done and she spent a brief stint in a mental health ward after attempting suicide. The book includes a few crafting instructions interspersed between her own stories of these crafts and how they've helped her through tough times in her life. Poetry. I Am The Rage by Dr. Martina McGowan. This is a small collection of poems that details Dr. McGowan's feelings about being black in America and America's history of slavery and segregation. History. A Cure for Darkness by Alex Riley. It's a book that details the history of depression and how psychologists and other scientists have attempted to cure depression and some other mental illnesses throughout the years. It's a very interesting read for someone interested in psychology, but might be too textbook-like for most people to enjoy. Mad Madame LaLaurie by Victoria Costner Love and Lorelai Shannon. I really like the facts of Madame LaLaurie put side by side with her sensational legends that have been warped with time. However, the book is redundant in many places, constantly repeating itself, which was annoying, especially since it was a super short book. There was also a lot of conjecture thrown about on the parts of the authors. Their opinions are blatantly thrown into several places as if there were fact, with no proof to back their guesses. This book either should have been a lot longer and rich with information, or a lot shorter. Graphic novels. The Adventure Zone, Here There Be Gerblins. The Adventure Zone, Murder on the Rockport Limited. The Adventure Zone, Pedals to the Metal. And The Adventure Zone, The Crystal Kingdom. All these books are by the McElroy Brothers, their dad, and Carrie Pish. It's based on the Adventure Zone podcast with the McElroy Brothers and their father. It's their D&D playthrough turned into a graphic novel. It's a lot of fun and full of hilarity. And finally, we'll end with the manga. Dick Fight Island by Rai Benike. A young man from each of the eight tribes must fight in the arena to choose who will become the next king of the islands. What weapons will they use? Their penises. The last to come in the tournament will be crowned the new king. Romance happens. Smut happens, obviously, and comedy happens. Sex Ed 120% by Kikiki Tataki. This is a comedy novel surrounding a high school sex education class. The teacher realizes the curriculum doesn't cover several important topics, so she goes off book and teaches her students important information. The school is against this, but she finds ways to covertly break the rules. Kind of. It's cute and queer in some places. Syrup, a Yuri Anthology Volume 1 by Yukiko, Naoko Kodama, Yoshi Murakana, and Milk Mornaga. It's a collection of lesbian love stories that revolve around adult working age women, as opposed to high school age girls. A lot of these were really cute, with one story inside of it being really disturbing. I likely won't read the next volume simply because of that one story inside of it that I really didn't like. And there you have it. Those are the 63 books I've read during 2021. 
I hope at least one of them has captured your attention and you give it a chance. For anyone interested, I'll put all of the titles and authors in the description below in chronological order of when I read them. And I will see you all the next time. Goodbye!